So he tells Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, the son that you love, Isaac, and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice, a burnt offering unto me. But not only that, I want you to travel to the region of Moriah. I will show you the mountain. People, that's a three days journey. Tonight, we're going to get back on track. We're going back to the book of Genesis. So if you would, turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 22. And let me give you a little bit of background information before we dive into this chapter. Chapter 22 is a pivotal point in Abraham's life. It's the ultimate test. And of course, we know the story. Abraham passes the test with flying colors. But this is also a pivotal point in the book of Genesis. From this point on, the focus begins to change from Abraham and Sarah to Isaac. In chapter 23, Sarah dies. In chapter 24, Abraham finds a wife for Isaac. And of course, we're introduced to Rebekah. In chapter 25, Abraham dies. And so the focus is then placed entirely upon Isaac. But then that's going to shift again. And the focus is going to be on Jacob. And then on Joseph, which sets up the story of the Exodus and how God created a nation from the descendants of Abraham and was in the process of fulfilling that. But tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to study Abraham's ultimate test in chapter 22. So turn in your Bibles, as I said, to the book of Genesis chapter 22. And I want you to look at verses 1 and 2. Follow along with me as I read this. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham... And he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, I want you to underline the word tempt in verse number one. The word tempt is a bad translation. You see, the word tempt is translated from the Hebrew word nasa, which means to test. In fact, the King James Version the NIV, the New American Standard, and the NLT all use the word test instead of tempt, which is the right translation. This is one of the few times that the King James Version just gets it wrong. Now, let me explain the difference between a test and being tempted, because there's a huge difference. To tempt someone means you're trying to entice them to sin. You're trying to get them to do something that's wrong. In James chapter 1, verse number 13, it tells us that God does not tempt anyone. Go ahead and turn there if you don't mind. Look at James chapter 1 verse 13. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. So let me make this very clear. God does not tempt people. So when we're reading along in the book of Genesis chapter 22, and it says that Abraham was tempted, if you have the King James Version, you need to cross that out. God was not tempting Abraham. Instead, God was testing him, and there's a big difference. A test is an experience or exercise designed to determine the level of a person's faith, knowledge, skill, etc. So what God was doing was testing Abraham. He was testing him to determine his level of faith. Now, I'm sure that raises a big question with the majority of you. And I know what that question is. You're thinking, now wait a minute, Alan. God is omniscient. And if God is omniscient, why would he need to test Abraham? Didn't he already know the level of Abraham's faith? Well, of course he did. Well, if that's the case, then why did God test Abraham? Well, he did it for Abraham's benefit, not for his benefit. You see, Abraham didn't know whether he had the faith to do whatever God asked of him or not. And he had no way of knowing without being tested. And to be honest with you, most of the time, we don't know how we're going to act in a specific situation until we face that situation. Let's be honest. We think we know how we're at, we will act, but we really don't until we're in that situation. Now, this test was a growing experience for Abraham, but it was also very revealing. It was very enlightening. He not only found out how far he was willing to go for God, but he also found out how far God was willing to go for us. And I'll explain what I mean by that when we get to the end of this lesson. So let's look in depth at the test that God put Abraham through. Turn back to verse number two. 
Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Now, I want you to notice that God was very specific on telling Abraham what to do. He was to take his son, his only son, the one he loved, Isaac. And he was to sacrifice him as a burnt offering to God. Now, listen to me because this is very important. If God ever wants us to do something that seems crazy, he will be very specific And he will make it crystal clear as to what he wants you to do. In other words, he's never going to ask you to do something extremely unusual. Something that seems crazy without making sure that you know exactly what you're supposed to do. And I'll be honest with you, that's a great lesson for Pentecostals and Charismatics. Because I've seen people do stupid things. Because they had a gut feeling that they were supposed to do something for God. And after it blew up in their face, and they made a fool of themselves... And they made a fool of God. They finally admitted that they didn't have any clear direction or any specifics from God. It was all based on this inkling, this feeling that they had. Listen to me. If God wants you to do something that seems crazy, don't do it. Unless, and there's always an unless. Unless God's been very specific on what you're supposed to do and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has spoken to you and it goes along with the Word of God. But I have seen so many people do foolish things. I mean things that get their families in trouble. They'll sell things and and, and then they'll go into deep poverty and all of a sudden they'll find out that wasn't what God wanted them to do. Now most of the time they won't admit it. But every once in a while, you'll see them say, you know what, that wasn't God, that was me. And everyone else was saying, don't do it. Well, here Abraham's supposedly going to do something that seems crazy. He's going to offer his son as a sacrifice. Now, you need to understand something. All of the other people around Abraham did this very thing. They offered their children unto their pagan gods. And God said, this is an abomination. And then all of a sudden, God pops up and he says, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac as a burnt offering. So I want you to see that God spoke directly to Abraham and he was very specific on what what he wanted Abraham to do so there would be no misunderstanding. He was told to take his son, his only son, the one he loved. And then he called him by name. Isaac, and he was to sacrifice him as a burnt offering to God in a specific place, the region of Moriah, on a specific mountain that he was going to reveal to Abraham. Now people, this was the ultimate test. Not just because Abraham loved Isaac. Most of us look at this and we go, boy, that was the ultimate test. Because Abraham loved Isaac. It was his son. But it wasn't just because of that. It was also because of the promises that God had made concerning Isaac. Remember, it was through Isaac and Isaac's descendants that the seed of the woman was to come. All future blessings, including the blessings of salvation, were to come through Isaac and Isaac alone. God had specifically told Abraham time after time again that Isaac was going to marry, he was going to have a family, and through his descendants, the deliverer, the seed of the woman that God had promised all the way back in Genesis chapter Chapter 3 was going to come. And now God is telling Abraham to kill him. To offer him as a sacrifice. And for the very first time, Abraham is confronted with a conflict between what God's God's commanded him to do and what God has promised to do. Now, think about this. Yes, yes. Abraham had been tested before this. His faith was tested when God told him to leave his family and his home and to travel into a land that he was going to show him and he would bless him for doing that. His faith was tested when God promised to give him and Sarah a son after she had reached the age of menopause and really was well past that age. His faith was tested when God told him to send Ishmael away. But Abraham had never been tested like this. This test involved a conflict between God's promises about Isaac and God's command to sacrifice Isaac. And in Abraham's mind, there was only two ways that this could play out. Either God was erratic, 
wavering from one plan to another so he can't be trusted to fulfill what he's promised. Because now all of a sudden he's changing his mind, he's changing his plans. Or God's faithful. And if he's made a promise, he will fulfill it no matter what. So that meant if Abraham sacrificed Isaac, as God commanded him to do, God would have to turn around and resurrect Isaac in order to fulfill the promises that he had made to him. And the test was which of the two things did Abraham believe? Did he believe that God couldn't be trusted? And if he killed Isaac, then the promises would die along with Isaac? Or that God could be trusted, and if he killed Isaac, God would resurrect him in order to fulfill the promises that he had made. Now people, that's the test in a nutshell. Do you trust God? Do you not trust God? God's made promises. Do you trust him to fulfill those promises if you obey him? Or do you not trust him? That's the test in a nutshell. Now, of course, we know what happened. Abraham passed the test with flying colors. He believed that if he obeyed God and sacrificed Isaac, God would bring him back to life. Now, how do we know that? How do we know that Abraham believed that if he killed his son, if he killed Isaac, that God would raise him from the dead? How do we know that? Anyone know? Well, the Bible tells us that. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Let's read verses 17 through 19. And I'm going to focus in on verse number 19. It's talking about this very event. Notice what it says. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Now, how do we know it was by faith? Well, he's going to explain. Abraham, who had received God's promises... Not just any promises, what promises? He had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac, even though God had told him. Here's the specific promise. Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned. Now wait a minute. God made this promise. He's never been married. He has no children. And now God's calling me or telling me, to kill him. So, verse 19, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God would bring him back to life again. Wow. Verse 19 specifically tells us that the reason Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son is because he believed that God would bring him back to life. Now, let me ask you a question. Why would God put Abraham through that? I mean, let's be honest. How many of you think that taking that type of test was really pushing it a little bit too far? Anyone? Let me go a little bit further. Women, especially women. How many of you think that it was cruel to test Abraham like that? Now put yourself in his place. Don't you think that that was a little bit cruel? Now, personally, I wouldn't want to be put through a test like that, especially if it was drawn out for three days. Can you imagine him? He doesn't just say, okay, I'm telling you to do this. Don't think about it. Just do it. You know, sometimes with faith, we're just put in a position where all of a sudden it's like, we got to act or we don't. And oh, my faith, I just step out. But sometimes God draws this test out. So he tells Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, the son that you love, Isaac, and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice, a burnt offering unto me. But not only that, I want you to travel to the region of Moriah. I will show you the mountain. People, that's a three days journey. You've got time to really think about this. Man, I wouldn't want to have to go through a test that lasts for three days when you're talking about sacrificing your child. Now, turn back to Genesis chapter 22 and let's read verses 3 and 4. So Abraham rose early in the morning and he saddled his donkey. And he took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering. <laughs> You're out there cutting the wood. Now put yourself in Abraham's place. You're splitting the wood. This is the wood. No one else is going to do it. You're splitting the wood that you're going to burn the carcass of your son on. And he arose and he went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, 
Because he's been down around Beersheba. He's got to travel to Moriah. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and he saw the place from a distance. Now, I want you to imagine what was going through Abraham's mind during those three days that they were traveling. Because three days is an eternity when you're going through a test like Abraham was. So what do you think was going through his mind as he was traveling for these three days? Do you think that they were laughing and talking and joking? Or do you think that they're saying, boy, Abraham's off in his own little world. You can tell that his heart's heavy. You can tell that he's sad. You can tell that something's not right. So what do you think was going through his mind? Well, I can tell you. He was thinking about all of the promises that God had made concerning Isaac. And he was wondering how in the world God is going to be able to fulfill those promises if he does what God told him to do and he kills him. Now, you've made these specific promises to me, God. And God, I've, I, I've always found you to be trustworthy. I've always found you to be faithful. And now you've made all these great promises, and we've seen this miraculous work where Sarah's womb was rejuvenated. You, you renewed her years. Where she wasn't able to conceive, you healed her womb, and she has this son. And now we believe everything's going to be great. And you're telling me to kill him. Now, God, I see these promises but I'm wondering, how in the world are you going to fulfill these promises if I do what you tell me to do? And the only answer that Abraham could come up with is that God was going to have to bring Isaac back to life. And no matter how many ways he looked at it, he kept coming back to the very same answer. If God wants me to sacrifice my son, my only son, and he's made these promises to me, and the only way these promises can be fulfilled is if he's alive, he's going to have to bring Isaac back alive after I kill him. And by the time he gets to his destination, he's determined that God is going to resurrect Isaac after he offers him as a sacrifice. And how do we know that? Now that's really good thinking, Alan, but how do you know that? We know that not only because of what we're told in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 19, but also because of what Abraham said when they reached their destination. Turn back to Genesis chapter 22 and look at verse 5. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy... Now, that's kind of an interesting translation because we're going to find out that he's not a boy. In the Hebrew, it means young man. While I and the young man go over there, we will worship and then we will come back to you. Now, did you catch that? He's told his servants to wait while he and Isaac went to Mount Moriah and then they both would come back. How many of you caught that? Did you catch it? Now, look at the last part of verse number 5 and underline that word we. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the young man go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Now, that tells us that once they got to their destination, Abraham was thoroughly convinced that after he sacrificed Isaac, God was going to raise him from the dead because there was no other way that God could fulfill his promises if Isaac was dead. And God was trustworthy. He had faith. He had seen God work and this is what God's going to have to do. Isaac will return to him. Now, just to make sure that everyone knew exactly what Abraham believed when they were the, when the writer of Hebrews was going through and giving examples of faith, he puts down specifically, exactly what Abraham believed in this event. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19 again. It's said in different ways if you have the King James Version or the New American Standard or the NIV or the NLT, but they all mean the same thing. Notice what it says. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son. Now, that's interesting. He was ready. I'm going to do it. Nothing's going to hold me back. You said it, God. I'm going to do it. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Now, why was he ready to do this? Because Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died God would bring him back to life again. So, back to my original question that I didn't answer. How many of you think, and none of you answered, I don't think, maybe some of you did. How many of you think that it was cruel to put Abraham through that? 
If God's omniscient and he knows that Abraham's willing to do that, he knows where the level of his faith is, why in the world would he put Abraham through that? That agony, those three days, working it through his mind till he's finally to the place where he's ready. Why do you think God did that? Two reasons. If you're taking notes, write this down. The first reason is because this event foreshadows what Jesus Christ would do for us 2,000 years later. In fact, the story is what theologians call a type of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ at Calvary. Now, does everyone know what the word type means, theologically speaking? Well, if not, let me give you a definition. And then I'm going to give you an example of a type. A type is defined as a figure, representation, or symbol of something to come, such as an event in the Old Testament that foreshadows an event in the New Testament. Now, let me give you an example. The Exodus is a type of the salvation process through Jesus Christ. Just as Moses delivered the children of Israel out of bondage and led them to the promised land, Jesus Christ has delivered us from the bondage of sin and is leading us to the promised land, which is heaven. Do you see the similarities? And we could go right down the line. Actually, we could go to the night of the Passover. We could see when the angel of death passed over and the blood was put there, and we could take all of these little things and we could compare them to what Jesus did and we would find out that Jesus is our Passover lamb. We could go further and really get into this in detail, but I want you to see that we can just break it down to its most basic common elements. Moses delivered the children of Israel out of bondage and led them to the promised land. Just as Jesus leads us out of the bondage of sin, or delivered us out of the bondage of sin, and leads us to the promised land, which is heaven. Now, that's a type. It's an event in the Old Testament that's symbolic of an event in the New Testament. It foreshadows an event in the New Testament. What do we mean by foreshadows? Well, we understand what a shadow is. Shadow is. If, if we have a tree here and the sun is shining on this side, well, it shines through and it casts a shadow. But we think of that shadow as being behind the object. So when we are talking about foreshadowing something theologically, what we're saying is this event, as God's revelation shines through that, that shadow that it casts, it's the actual real event that this is just a type of. It's foreshadowing what's going to come in the future. That's what we mean by a type. Now, how do I know that the story of Abraham sacrificing his son is meant to be a type of God sacrificing his son. How do I know that? Well, again, the Bible tells me. Turn back to Hebrews eleven nineteen. 19, except this time, I'm going to read it out of the New American Standard. And the reason I'm going to is because it translates one of the Greek words much better. But it's only one word. That's why I didn't use it originally. Look back at Hebrews eleven nineteen. 19. Abraham considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead. And so if you take out the word men, those it's italicized. Basically, it's that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Now, what does it mean he also received him back as a type? See, he received him back because in his mind, it was a done deal. I'm doing this for God. But when he received him back, it was a Type. He's telling us that this event was a type. Now, the King James Version uses the word figure, but they both mean the same thing. They both mean that the story of Abraham sacrificing his son is meant to be a type of God sacrificing his son. So, let's look at the similarities between the two, and I don't have much time. I'm just going to look at some of the basics, but I want you to understand that we could probably spend another two weeks just looking at the similarities between the event of Abraham sacrificing his son and God, 2,000 years later, sacrificing Jesus Christ for us. But we're just going to look at the basics. In our story, Abraham is to offer his only son. Not just his son, his only son. Now, wait a minute. Didn't Abraham have another son? That's not a trick question. Did Abraham have another son? Yes. Ishmael was his son. But that son was conceived naturally. 
There was nothing supernatural about it. Abraham was able to naturally conceive Ishmael through his concubine, Hagar. But Abraham only had one son who was conceived supernaturally. The son of promise, and that was Isaac. Now, believe it or not, God has many sons. Now, before you stone me, listen to what I'm going to say, all right? The angels in the Old Testament are referred to as what? Sons of God, small s. Do you remember when we were studying in Genesis chapter 6 and we were looking at the Nephilim? And it talks about the sons of God had sex with the daughters of men. And we went back to see how that phrase, sons of God, was used. And we went through the Old Testament. And what we found out is that phrase, sons of God, refers to angels. So angels are referred to as sons of God. But they were not born, and I shouldn't say that. I should say that they weren't always with God. They were actually made by God. Small s, sons of God. As Christians, are we sons of God? Now, that's not a trick question. I know many of them are trick questions and you don't want to answer. But as, as Christians, are we sons of God? Yes, but we're adopted. We are adopted into the family of God. And we're regenerated. But God only has one supernatural son. Only one who was born of a virgin. The only begotten. Only one who is part of the Godhead. Only one who existed with him from the very, very beginning. And it's interesting as we studied through Genesis chapter 1. And it talked about how the spirit was hovering over the water. And we were looking and seeing the plurality of how God was used. And then God went further and said let us make God in our image. So there was only one who was with God from the very beginning was not created. So we're talking about his only son. And so when we're talking about Abraham's only son, we're talking about his supernatural son like God's supernatural son. Not only that, Abraham was told to go to Mount Moriah. Now, does everyone know where Mount Moriah is? If you ever go to Israel, we will go to Mount Moriah. Anyone ever heard of Mount Moriah? Where is Mount Moriah? Do we know today where Mount Moriah is? Yes. Mount Moriah was where Jesus was crucified. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know that because of 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse number 1. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. So, Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. Now, if we ever get there, we'll find out how they built it up. Herod actually had to build up the temple mount. And the way he built it up is he went and he cut out the mountain. And as he was cutting out the mountain to build this temple, up for the temple place, this is where the temple was placed, on the temple mount. But where Jesus was crucified was outside the city walls where they were cutting it out, which was part of Mount Moriah. So he was to go and to sacrifice his son at the very place that Jesus was crucified 2,000 years later. Not only that, but Isaac carried the wood that he was supposed to be killed upon on his shoulders. Look at verse number 6. Notice what it tells us. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife and the two of them walked on together. Now people, this is perfect typology as Christ carried his own cross. So here we have Isaac carrying the wood that he's going to be killed upon and then we see 2,000 years later Jesus Christ carrying the wood that he's going to be killed upon. And to top it off, Isaac was totally submissive to his father even when he realized he was going to sacrifice him. Now look at verses 7 through 10, and I'm going to show you something very interesting. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, at that time, this is before the Mosaic law. This is before the Levitical sacrifices. So therefore, the burnt offering was used as a sin offering. And what they used was a lamb. So he's asking a very honest question. Dad, you've been quiet. You haven't said anything for three days. You haven't even looked at me. 
Now we're here. Where's the lamb? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. Now this is what I want you to notice. He bound his son Isaac and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now, when we think about him doing this, we think of Abraham as being a little boy, right? We read the word boy, but that's not what it means in the Hebrew. Not only that, he has to take the wood. This is going to have to be enough wood to be able to burn his carcass. We're talking about a young man. We're not talking about a boy in his teens. We're not even talking about his early 20s. What most people don't realize is that Isaac was approximately the age of Jesus Christ when he was crucified. You see, this occurred shortly before Sarah died. Sarah died, and we're going to find this out in the very next chapter. It just comes along and says Sarah was 127 years old when she died. Now, how old was she when she had Isaac? The scripture tells us she was 90. She died at 127. Isaac was 37 years old when Sarah died. And as you put this together in the timeline, this occurs about four years before she dies. So how old is Isaac? He's 33 years old. So most scholars believe that he was old enough to not only resist Abraham, but he could have easily manipulated him because this would have put Abraham at about... If she died at 127, and it's about four years after that, it's 124, he's 10 years older, he's about 134 years old. So you've got this 33-year-old young, strong man and a 134-year-old father. And he's building this altar and he lays this wood there. And he comes up and says, son, I need to bind you. And Isaac knows what's happening at this point. He says, you're my dad. And he submits to him. He allows him to bind him. And I'll be honest with you, Abraham would not have had the strength probably to lift him up and put him up on the altar. So Isaac gets on the altar for him. And he's submitted into the will of his father just as Jesus Christ did 2,000 years later. And of course, 2,000 years later, God does what Abraham said he would do. When Isaac asked, where's the lamb? The title of Jehovah Jireh is given for the very first time. He looks at him and he says, God will provide. And he says, Jehovah Jireh. He's going to provide the lamb. And of course, 2,000 years later, when it's time for the seed of the woman to come, God provides the lamb who's going to take away the sins of the world. And John the Baptist refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So the first reason that God put Abraham through that, that ordeal was because it foreshadowed what Jesus Christ was going to do 2,000 years later. And it lets us know what God went through. Most of us never think about God's emotions. Now, Abraham believed with all of his heart God was going to raise him from the dead. But it still broke his heart to have to sacrifice his son. Listen to me. It was no less difficult for God to sacrifice his son than it was for Abraham. In fact, it was even more difficult, and I'll tell you why. As, him, as Isaac being a sin offering, he really couldn't have died for anyone but himself. So he would have only had to pay the penalty for his sins. But when Jesus comes as the lamb, he's going to take away the sins of the world. God the Father looks at him and says, okay, you're going to have to take away the sins of the world. But you're going to have to take the sins upon you. And when you suffer for everything that they've done, not just die, but you're going to have to suffer for everything. Then you're going to go to hell and you're going to have to pay the penalty for everyone who's ever lived in the world, whether they receive you or not. Every sin that's ever been committed. And only then are you going to be resurrected. I'll be honest with you. Even though God knew he's going to raise Jesus Christ from the dead, I believe it was much more painful for God than it was Abraham. The second reason that God put Abraham through that, that ordeal, that test 
was because it explained why God was willing to sacrifice his son for us. You see, the whole reason that Abraham was willing to sacrifice his only son was because he loved God. And Abraham's love for God was nothing compared to God's love for us. So if Abraham was willing to sacrifice his only son, knowing that he would be raised again, brought back to life, how much more was God willing to sacrifice his own son, knowing that he's going to bring him back to life? Because God's love is so much greater. And John 3.16 takes on a whole new meaning when you understand this story. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now I think there's a third reason, and I haven't put it in the notes, as to why God put Abraham through this test. I believe that through this process, God knew that it was going to dawn on Abraham what God was going to have to do, do to redeem us from sin. I think that when he had to go through this, it dawned on him what the seed of the woman was going to have to do. The seed of the woman, the son, is going to have to be a sacrifice. And God, you're going to have to kill him, aren't you? And I believe this because of what Jesus says in John chapter 8. This isn't going to come up on the screens. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and turn there. This is John chapter 8, verses 56, 57, and 58. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now, is he talking about that Abraham saw it in heaven? No, 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 no. Abraham saw it when he took his son and he bound him and he put it on the altar and he got ready to kill him because of his love for God. And God stopped him and brought it in and it dawned on him. I see what you're saying, God. My son can't die for sin. He's a sinful creature. But the seed of the woman, this one you promised, the deliverer that's going to come through my descendants, through him, that's going to be your son. And he saw that day 2,000 years in the future. And he rejoiced. God, I understand for the first time. I think it broke his heart as to what God was going to have to do because only he could truly understand the turmoil and the emotions that he was going through. But it dawned on him. God, I see, you're making me realize what you're going to have to do in order to redeem us from our sins. Now, notice what Jesus says. Let me read that. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And when did he see it? At that time, he was sacrificing his son. Of course, he never did slay him. We haven't read the rest of the story. God stops him and provides a ram. And he saw it and rejoiced. What did he see? He saw that God will provide on Mount Moriah when his son comes, carries his cross, willingly submits to you, Father, lays down his life as an offering for our sin, and you will raise him again as you promised to do, my son, or I thought you would. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old. And hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I send you... Before Abraham was, I am. I existed with God from the very beginning. But I am the son that Abraham saw coming. Well, in Genesis chapter 23, 24, and 25, three major events are recorded. The death of Sarah in chapter 23, the marriage of Isaac to Rebekah in chapter 24, and the death of Abraham in chapter 25. Now, originally I had intended to skip chapter 23 and move on to the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah, but the teacher in me just can't do it. I was going to do it, but I thought, no, I just can't do it. So tonight we're going to cover the death of Sarah. So turn to Genesis chapter 23 and let's read verses 1 and 2. Sarah lived to be 127 years old. She died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan, and Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. Now, as it says, Sarah was 127 years old when she died. She was 90 years old when she gave birth to Isaac, which made Isaac 37 at the time of her death. She had lived long enough to see Isaac grow up 
to be a man and to actually be the type of man that she was hoping to have. But she didn't live long enough to see him get married and to have children because Isaac didn't marry until he was 40 years old. Look with me, if you would, in the book of Genesis chapter 25, verse number 20. It says, when Isaac was 40 years old, he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Oram, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean. So Isaac got married three years after Sarah died. Now, does anyone know why Isaac waited so long to get married? I mean, let's be honest. He waited until he was 40 years old. And you're thinking, why in the world did he wait so long? Because after all, God promised to turn Abraham's descendants into a great nation, and that promise was supposed to be fulfilled through Isaac and Isaac alone. So you would think that Abraham and Rebekah would have been pushing Isaac to get married. But instead, it's almost as if they're dragging their feet and arranging a mate for him. Does anyone know why? It's because they didn't want Isaac marrying a Canaanite woman. Instead, they wanted him to marry someone, a distant relative from their old homeland. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis chapter 24, verses 2 through 4. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. This is the part where Abraham realizes, I need to arrange a wife for Isaac to marry. Notice what it says. One day, Abraham said to his oldest servant, the man in charge of his household, Take an oath by putting your hand under my thigh. Swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not allow my son to marry one of these local Canaanite women. That's pretty harsh. Swear you won't allow Isaac, my son, to marry one of these local Canaanite women. Go instead to my homeland, to my relatives, and find a wife there for my son Isaac. And that's why Isaac waited until he was 40 years old to get married. But my point is this. Isaac was 37 years old when his mother died, and Sarah never got to see him married. Now, turn back to Genesis chapter 23 and look at the last part of verse number 2 again. She died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. Now, as you might have guessed, Abraham loved Sarah very much, very deeply. And he didn't just mourn. He wept over her. The word weep is translated from the Hebrew word baka, and it means to cry great tears. In fact, it literally means to cry great tears until there's no more tears to cry. How many of you have ever cried to the point where there's no more tears? Basically, that's what Abraham did, which tells us that Abraham was brokenhearted. And you can see why when you consider how long they were married. You see, in the ancient Middle East culture, it was common for a man in his upper 20s or early 30s to marry a young woman in her mid to upper teens. That's why Abraham was 10 years older than Sarah. So in all probability, they were married for well over 100 years. Think about this. She was probably married to Abraham. If he was 29 years old, she would have been 19. But she lived to be 127. She could have been all the way 27 years old before she got married to Abraham. And she still would have been married to him for over a century. We don't think of those things. But if you think about how long they were married, you can imagine when she died, how heartbroken Abraham was. But he also realized, and this is to his credit, that life goes on and that he needed to get on with the business of living. And we see that as we study the funeral arrangements that he made. But we also see that he never lost his faith. In fact, his faith was stronger than ever, and we see it played out as he's making these funeral arrangements. So let's look at the funeral arrangements that he made. Turn with me to verses 3 and 4. Then Abraham rose from beside his dead wife and spoke to the Hittites. He said, I am a foreigner and stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site here so I can bury my dead. Now, what's interesting is as heartbroken as Abraham was, he still had to make arrangements for Sarah's burial. So he got up beside his dead wife. You see, in the Middle East, the dead person was placed in a separate tent. And the mourners would sit down on the floor of the tent to mourn over the body. So Abraham tore himself away from Sarah, and he went to make arrangements for her burial. He didn't have Isaac do it. He didn't have one of his servants do it. He took care of the arrangements personally because he knew what he wanted. So he went to the leaders of the Hittites who sat in the gate of the city because that's where business was conducted at that time in their culture, at the gate of the city. And that's where Abraham went in order to buy a plot to marry Sarah in. Look at verse number 10. Ephron, 
the Hittite was sitting among his people and he replied to Abraham in the hearing of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of the city. Now, the reason that Abraham went to the leaders of the city who were sitting at the gate, rather than going straight to Ephron in private, is because he had to get consent to purchase land from the leaders of the cities first before he could purchase any land from an individual. And why was that? Because he wasn't a citizen. He was, in his own words, a foreigner and stranger among them. And in that culture, an individual was not allowed to sell his property to someone who was a stranger and a foreigner unless the leaders of that city or the leaders of that land consented to it and approved of it. Now, look back at verse number four. He said, I am a foreigner and stranger among you. Sell me some property for burial sites so I can bury my dead. You see, as I said, as a foreign and stranger, he didn't have the right to purchase property without the consent of the city leaders. So the first thing he had to do was get their consent. So he went to the gate of the city, and even though everyone knew him, he still identified himself as a foreigner and stranger among them. Now, those words have more spiritual significance than most people realize. And they held a deeper meaning to Abraham than they did to the Hittites. You see, the Hittites simply thought that Abraham was saying that he wasn't one of them. And even though that was true, those words meant much more to Abraham than that. To Abraham, it was a statement of faith. It was a confession that his hope wasn't here on this earth, but his hope was in heaven with God. And this perspective on life was passed down to all of his descendants. So the Jews, from the time of Abraham, always saw themselves as strangers and foreigners on this earth. earth. And even when they possessed the promised land, they still saw themselves and referred to themselves as strangers and foreigners on this earth because they had been taught that their hope was not on this earth. Their hope was in heaven with God. Now, let me prove that to you. Let's go back to the Mosaic Law. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, verse number 23. Notice what it says. The land must not be sowed permanently. Why? Because the land is mine. It's not yours. And you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Now, people, that's really interesting. If you remember the culture of the time of the Israelites, they could sell their land But when the year of Jubilee came, it returned to the rightful owners, always went back to the family. And so you really didn't ever buy land, you actually leased land, but they're explaining why. He comes and says, the land must not be sowed permanently, and here's why. Because the land is mine, it is not yours. And you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Now let me ask you this, if that was revelation from God to Moses, to the children of Israel, do you believe that that principle still applies to God today? Now, we're not talking about selling the land. I'm just talking about the principle behind that the things we own are not ours. Whose are they? God's. And what does God say our proper perspective on life should be? That we are foreigners and strangers here. And that is what this scripture is saying. Everything on the earth is God's. And while we're on this earth, we're simply foreigners and strangers taking care of God's property. Our home is in heaven. It's not here on earth. And every Jew was taught that at the synagogue, in their home, by the scribes, and at the time of Jesus, by every rabbi. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 29, verses 14 through 15. Let me show you that even in the time of David, this is the way it was taught. Notice what it says. But who am I, and who are my people, that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you. Now, who does you refer to? God, everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your hand, God. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Now, this is part of David's prayer when he is blessing all of the material that's going to go into the building of the temple. Now, remember, God did not allow him to build it. He said, your son is going to build this. But David wanted to make sure that his son did it. So what did he do? He accumulated all of this material so that when his son began to reign, he would have everything he needed to be able to build the temple. And so he's praying over this and blessing it, and this is his prayer. And what he's doing is reaffirming the belief that earth is not our home, heaven is, and that's where we place our hope. And that we are supposed to look at ourselves as strangers and foreigners here on this earth. Now look at Psalms chapter 39, verse number 12. 
Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Don't be deaf to my weeping. I dwell with you as a foreigner, a stranger, as all my ancestors were. Now, where in the world did they get this idea? They got this idea from Abraham. And this was what all the Jews were taught. They were all taught that they were strangers and foreigners on this earth, and their real home was in heaven with God. Now, as Christians, we're supposed to have the very same perspective. We're supposed to realize that this earth is not our permanent home. I've got news for you. If you think that earth is is your permanent home, I've got news for you. You're going to die. You are going to die. And you were made to be an eternal creature. Your soul was created to live forever. Therefore, this is not your permanent home. Your permanent home is here or is in heaven with God. And while we're here on this earth, we're to think of ourselves as foreigners and strangers. Now, yes, we take care of business while we're here on this earth, but it's God's business. And every time someone dies who's a Christian, they go home. They go to the real home, which is in heaven. And we as Christians, we need to recognize that and realize that. And that's why Paul was writing in the book of Thessalonians. He said, we don't have or we are not without hope as others are. And then he begins to talk about the rapture. And he begins to talk about the resurrection and what's going to take place. And the reason he does that is because he was taught like all Jews. We're just passing through here. God owns all of this. This is his land, it's not ours. And so we are strangers and foreigners in God's land, but he's creating a permanent home for us. And as Christians, we should believe that. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verses 13 through 16. In this chapter, which is known as the chapter of faith, we're looking at all of these great men of faith, but now he comes and he draws a conclusion and he's going to use them as an example to us as Christians. Notice what it says. All these people, all of these great men of faith were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. In fact, the majority of things that were promised unto Abraham, he did not receive. Yes, he did have the son, but he never saw the seed of the woman come through her. He never got to see the grandchildren. He never got to see the great-grandchildren. He didn't get to see them brought out of this land of Egypt and created into a great nation. He never got to see that. And so they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. In other words, recognize one day... Admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own because this is not our permanent home. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country. Now notice this, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. That city is the new Jerusalem. It will be on the new earth. It will come down. And we that are Christians will dwell inside that new city. And it was Abraham that was looking forward to the promises being fulfilled sometime in the future. He was looking beyond even the seed of the woman. He was looking at those who would be delivered. And he realized when Sarah died, we're not going to see even a little bit of the promises that God has made. But we know that those promises are going to be fulfilled. And in heaven, we're going to see that. So when Abraham said that he was a foreigner stranger among them, the Hittites thought that he was simply saying that he wasn't one of them. And yes, he was saying that. But those words had much deeper meaning for Abraham. Yes, he was a foreigner stranger in the land of the Hittites, but he was also a foreigner, foreigner and stranger on the earth. His real home was in heaven with God. So those words had a deeper meaning to Abraham than they did the Hittites. And that's why even though he was heartbroken over the death of Sarah, the person he'd been married to for over a century, he could still get up and take care of business. It's because he believed that Sarah had gone home. Not her body, her soul. Her body was going to be resurrected on the great day of the Lord. So Abraham went to purchase a burial plot. In fact, that's a good lesson for us. You know, if I was to pass away, I'm sure Lisa would mourn and cry a little bit. But life goes on. And she wouldn't be mourning for me. 
Because the truth of the matter is, when I die, I'm just released from this body and my soul goes to the place that I'm looking forward to, which is heaven. And then when the rapture occurs, the Bible says, those who are dead or those who are sleeping Christ. Now, it's not referring to the soul because the soul goes to heaven. What's it referring to? The body, the body that's decayed. Those bodies are going to rise first, and it tells us in the book of Thessalonians that the body is going to be rejoined with the soul. One day, we're going to have a resurrected body. What type of body is it going to be? The same type of body that Jesus had when he was resurrected. And we're going to know even as we're known. That's what the scriptures say. So when someone passes away, we're not crying because they're lost. They're not lost. We know where they are. They're in heaven. We're crying because we're sad we're not going to see them again. And many things were left undone. Maybe we should have said things we didn't say. Maybe we said things we shouldn't have said. And we're sad about those things. But as Christians, we have this hope. And here Abraham is. He's heartbroken. His bride of over a century has passed away. And he's weeping to the point that He can't cry any more tears. And when he gets to that point, he stands up and he goes to take care of business. He doesn't go to his son Isaac and say, I just can't do it. You're just going to have to do it. He doesn't do that. He doesn't go to his servant and say, this is too tough of a time. I want you to go do this. No. He takes care of it. Because his hope is not on this earth. His hope is in heaven. Now, You need to understand what happened when he went out to purchase a burial plot. You see, in the Middle East, it was common to haggle over anything you were trying to purchase. And it's still that way today. So let me explain how the haggling process worked in the days of Abraham. Because if you don't understand that, then as you read through this, it doesn't make sense. But once you understand the way that Arabs are, and the way the culture was, and it's much like that today, In fact, I'll bring up some of the things that happened when we were at Turkey, but you need to understand that it's a whole different culture over there. So let me explain how this haggling process worked. The seller opened the negotiation by assuring the potential buyer that everything that he has is his and to just take whatever he wants. But he really doesn't mean it. He didn't mean it back then. You see, from their perspective, that's how you showed hospitality. Now, From our perspective today, from the Western mindset, if a person tells us to take whatever we want, but he really doesn't mean it, he's insincere. Right? Disingenuous. You can't believe him. But from their perspective, it's not insincere hospitality. It's just part of the process because in their culture, a potential buyer would never ever take what he wanted without purchasing it because that would be taking advantage of another person's hospitality, which is the height of rudeness. So they made the offer knowing it would never be accepted. So in Abraham's day, if you wanted to purchase something, you would come and you would say, I would like to purchase this. And he would say, everything that is mine is yours. Just take it. Now, we would go, great! But he doesn't mean it. Because in their culture, that would be the height of rudeness. And everyone understands the culture of hospitality. And so he knows the person's going to say, no, 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 no. Ah, you're too gracious. I cannot do that. And so they made the offer knowing it would never be accepted. Now, once they went through this formality of hospitality, then the seller would throw a price out there because you've refused to just take it. And you're insisting that he name a price. Now, the price that he throws out is usually five to six times more than what the item is worth. If it's land, it's five to six times more than the land is worth. If you want to buy a blanket, it's five to six times more than what the blanket is really worth. But he's going to do something really interesting. He's going to say it like this. Eh, it's worth $500, but what's $500 between you and me? Just take it, knowing that you can't do that. So you go, oh, that's gracious of you, but I don't have $500. And then the haggling begins to take place. And you continue to haggle until you reach an agreement or they realize that they can't come to an agreement. Now, if you understand the haggling process, you'll understand Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 14. Look at Proverbs 20, 14. The buyer 
haggles over the price saying it's worthless, then brags about getting a bargain. And likewise, the seller would complain that you ripped him off. And when you left his shop, he would brag about how he ripped you off. That's just part of the culture, and it's that way even today. In fact, what's kind of interesting is, if you go to Turkey, when you get ready to go to the spice market that was open in 1400 and something, honey, I mean, there's certain bazaars that have been open for, we're talking six, seven hundred years. And, of course, it's been modernized, and, you know, the buildings are still just as old as can be. They burned down many times, and they've been rebuilt, but they brought electricity in and that. But it, it, it's really an experience. But here's what's interesting. All of the store owners and the employees in there have memorized the streets of every major city in America. Oh, yeah. In fact, they know American geography better than Americans do. So when you come inside their store, they'll say, oh, you're American. And you'll say, yeah, I'm from America. And they'll say, where are you from? And if I said, well, I'm from Tahlequah, Oklahoma. He said, Tahlequah, where, where is that? Well, that's close to Tulsa. About Tulsa, Oklahoma. I know Tulsa. I have a cousin who lives there. And then they'll say, he lives over by Union School. You know where they have the Asbury Methodist Church over by 71st and 169. And you'll go, yeah, I know where that is. Well, there's a little suburb there. My cousin lives there. Are you close? What he's doing is he's trying to build a rapport with you. He has never been to America. He doesn't have a cousin in America. But what he wants to do is he wants to get to know you. Now, all he's doing is setting you up. He's trying to build that relationship. And then he's going to offer you some tea. Would you like some tea? And then you're going to say, oh, this is nice in the store. And he says, oh. Now, he won't tell you because you come from America. But if you were from that culture, it would go, oh, we're friends. What's between you and me? Just take it. If you were from that culture, oh, no, I can't take it. Because you would know that's the height of rudeness. And so he would say, Yes, please, just, just take it. And you would say, no, 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 no. I insist. I'll buy it from you. Throw me a price. Well, if you insist, da, 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 da. What's that between you and me? Like he's giving it away for free. And then you would begin to haggle. Now, because we're from America, they learn very quickly that we don't know what rudeness is. So they don't ever tell you what's in their store is yours. But they come in and they still try to build that rapport. And then they tell you how great it is. And then you begin to haggle. And you begin to say things like, well, in Tulsa, where I'm from, I can buy this very same thing. Ten times cheaper than this. Oh, you can't buy this, that. Oh, yes, I can. I'll give you. <laughs> and then they'll throw out another price. And you just keep haggling until finally you come to an agreement or... You can't reach an agreement. Now, normally when you can't reach an agreement, you just leave. And they tell you, one time only, I give you this price. And they're very superstitious. So if you're the first one in the store, they usually will give you a great deal because they believe if they can make a sale, very first customer, then they're going to have a great day. So you learn to get to the spice market very early, and our, and our guide would get us to those markets very early if we were going to go to them. So we could be the first customer in there, because they're going to give you a better deal that way. But anyways, that's how you would haggle. So now that you understand the haggling process, let's look at how Abraham negotiated for a burial plot. Look at verses 3 through 6. Then Abraham rose beside his dead wife, and he spoke to the Hittites. Now, we're supposed to know that he rose in the tent, then he went to the gate of the city, as you read through the story. So he didn't rise from the dead, and then they're there. So then Abraham rose from beside his dead wife, and he spoke to the Hittites. He said, I'm a foreigner and stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site here so I can bury my dead. The Hittites replied to Abraham, Sir, listen to us. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choices of our tombs. None of us will refuse you his tomb for burying your dead. So Abraham approached the leaders and made his request known. What he wanted was a simple burial plot for Sarah, and he wanted their consent. So they make the formality of hospitality, this gesture of hospitality, and told him, what is theirs 
is his. Choose the choicest tomb and bury Sarah there. But remember, this is only a gesture of hospitality. Abraham is not supposed to take them up on this. He's supposed to politely refuse and insist on paying for the tomb, which he does. Look at verses 7 through 9. Then Abraham rose, and he bowed down before the people of the land, the Hittites. He said to them, if you are willing to let me bury my dead, then listen to me and intercede with Ephron, son of Zohar, on my behalf. So he will sell me the cave of Machpelah, which belongs to him and is at the end of his field. Ask him to sell it to me for the full price as a burial site among you. So now that the gesture of hospitality is out of the way, Abraham is allowed to get down to business. And he tells them what he wants to purchase. He wants to purchase the cave of Machpelah. And he doesn't want to buy any property around it. He just wants the cave. And it won't interfere with any of the plans that they might have. It won't interfere with the farming. It won't interfere with any grazing because this cave is at the end of the field. And then he tells them he'll pay them or pay Ephron whatever it's worth. Now, I want you to notice how the NIT, NIV translates this. Look at the last part of verse 9. Ask him to sell it to me full the, for the full price as a burial site among you. Now, that phrase... For the full price means whatever it's worth. Now, it's still not time to haggle yet. Because now Ephron, who owns the cave, has to go through a gesture of hospitality as the individual seller. See, he went to the leaders who were sitting in the gate and they had to go through this formality. They had to go through this gesture of hospitality. They offer to give it. He says no, and he insists he will buy it. So once he does that and gets their consent, now he goes to the individual who's there at the gate too, but he wants this specific piece of land. So now as the individual seller, you got to do this all over again. Does that make sense? So they're not ready to haggle yet. Because Ephron, who owns the cave, has to go through this gesture of hospitality as the individual seller. Look at verses 10 and 11. Ephron the Hittite was sitting among his people, and he replied to Abraham, in the hearing of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of a city, No, my lord, he said, listen to me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that's in it. I give it to you in the presence of my people. Bury your dead. Now, in the Western mind, great, but he doesn't mean it. In fact, Ephron is a sly dog because all Abraham wanted was a cave to bury Sarah in. He didn't want the field that was next to it. But by offering to give the field to Abraham along with the cave, he's now letting Abraham know that he cannot purchase the cave without purchasing the field. How many of you caught that? Because you don't understand the culture of the Middle East. He's acting like, oh, what's this between us? You can have the field and the cave. And everyone who understands the culture goes, ha ha, sly dog. You can't have the cave without the field. Now, Remember, even though he's offering to give it to Abraham, he doesn't really mean it. It's just a gesture of hospitality, and there is no way that Abraham can accept it. So now, Abraham is supposed to be polite and refuse this generous offer and insist on paying for it, which then allows Ephron to throw out a price. Well, if you insist on purchasing it, and of course, Abraham's expected to haggle over the price until they reach an agreement. So let's read verses 12 through 15. Again, Abraham bowed down before the people of the land. And he said to Ephron in their hearing, Listen to me, if you will, I will pay the price of the field, accept it from me so I can bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, Listen to me, my lord, the land is worth 400 shekels of silver. Now listen to this, I love this. But what is that between you and me? We're friends. Bury your dead. Now, there's no way that the land is worth 400 shekels of silver. But as I said, Abraham is expected to haggle with him. But Abraham doesn't do that. Instead, Abraham accepts, accepts his offer. And he has Ephron deed the property to him in front of the leaders of Hebron so that they can be witnesses to this transaction and everything is legal. Look at verses 16 through 18. 
Abraham agreed to Ephron's terms, which everyone's going, sucker, and weighed out for him the price he had named in the hearing of the Hittites. 400 shekels of silver, according to the weight current among the merchants. Now, do you understand why it says according to the current weight weigh current among the merchants? Does everyone understand that? Merchants had two sets of scales. If they bought something from you, they brought out this set of scales, and yours did not weigh as much. If you were purchasing something in pain, they brought out a separate set of scales, and they made sure that they got more money from you. The merchant scales meant that Ephron was going to get more than it was really supposed to be. So he allows Ephron, he brings out, according to the merchant scales, 400 shekels of silver. So Ephron's field in Machpelah, near Memra, both the field and the cave in it. Now, why would it say that? Because everyone in their culture says, yeah, he got stuck with the field. Both the field and the cave in it, and all the trees within the borders of the field. Now, why does it say that? Does anyone know? Because, oh yeah, we took Abraham. Man, he paid for every rock on that place and every tree on that place. He took it all. And he says, And all the trees within the borders of the field was deeded to Abraham as his property in the presence of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of the city. Now, why didn't Abraham haggle over the price? Because it really wasn't worth that much, and even Ephron expected him to haggle over the price. So why didn't he? Two reasons. Number one, because Abraham had more than enough money. Remember, Abraham's not just rich. Abraham is what we would consider to be filthy rich. He's a Warren Buffett. He's a Bill Gates. He's a billionaire in those terms back then. So, he's rich. This isn't going to hurt him. But he didn't become rich by paying too much for things. So what's the second reason? The second reason is because he intended this piece of property to be the family cemetery. And he wanted all of the Hittites to know that he paid not just full price for the property, he paid much more than it was worth. And that's why he took such care that everyone in the gate of the city understood that this piece of property was being deeded to them. Because from this point on, his future descendants are going to be buried in Canaan, the land that God promised to give to his descendants. In fact, here's what's interesting. Abraham, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, and Leah were all buried in the very same cave at Hebron. They were going to be planted in the land that God promised to give the children of Israel. And you can go there today. In fact, in Jesus' time, Herod actually built a monument over that cave because the cave of Machpelah is still there. You can go there and you can see this monument. You can go downstairs. Of course, there's some gates I didn't want to show you on this, but you can actually go to the place. Now, Herod built a monument over the cave, and then after the period of Constantine, when they started going in and building churches over every holy site, they turned it into a church. And then later, when the Muslims came in, they turned it into a mosque. But if you go there today, one portion of it is a mosque, and one portion of it is a synagogue. So here's a picture of it. Now, if you notice, this side is the synagogue. Now, see the minarets that's on the other side of the building? That half over on the other side is the mosque. Let me show you another picture. This is the Jewish synagogue side. Again, you see the minaret on the right side, but this is the entrance to go into the Jewish synagogue because this is a very holy place. People, this is where Sarah was buried. This is where Abraham was buried. This is where Isaac was buried. This is where Jacob was buried. This is where Leah was buried. And this is known. There is no discussion. This is the very cave at the very spot that he purchased. Let me show you one more picture of it. This kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like. Really nice spot looking up to it. Anyways, as we look at the funeral arrangements that he made, the thing that is the striking to us is that Abraham had faith. Yes, he was heartbroken. 
And you know, sometimes you have pastors and you have Christians that will tell you that when a loved one dies, if you're a Christian, you shouldn't cry. People, that's hogwash. That's not in the Bible. If you love them dearly, you're going to miss them. In fact, here's what's interesting. If you remember at Lazarus' funeral, and you remember when Lazarus died, Mary and Martha, of course, tried to send a message to Jesus, and he received it, that he was sick, he's near unto death, and you need to come. And of course, Jesus waited purposely until he died. He waited several days, and then he went to the, to the uh, funeral of Lazarus. And of course, what did Martha say? My Lord, if you'd been here, our brother wouldn't have died. That's an accusation. And it says that Jesus wept. The word wept in the Greek is dakru, and it's literally, it's written in the air's tense, and it literally means that he bursts out into tears. He just bawled like a baby. But here's the interesting thing. He knew that he was going to resurrect Lazarus, so why in the world did he cry? The reason he cried is because he understood that death is the enemy and it separates loved ones. And the only way that we're going to be reunited is in heaven one day. And so when a loved one dies, it's okay to cry. It's okay to mourn. But if you continue to mourn and don't go on with the business of life after that period of mourning, if you can't go on with your life, something's wrong. Because we have this hope. Yes, we're sad they're gone, but we understand something. They are home. When they were on this earth, they were a foreigner and stranger among us because this is not our permanent home. God owns this place, and we're just here. Our life is but a shadow. It's but a vapor, and then it's over. And our soul goes to be with God, and that is our permanent home. And so, even though we mourn for a little bit, there's a time when we need to get on with the business of life and we need to get on knowing that we're going to see them one day and this is not what life is all about. Life is all about heaven and a relationship with God and where we're going to spend eternity. Turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 24. This chapter gives us a beautiful account of how Rebecca became Isaac's wife. And it goes into quite a bit of detail. In fact, it's the longest chapter in the book of Genesis. It has 67 verses. Now, because there is so much material in this chapter, we're not going to be able to cover the entire chapter tonight. Hopefully, you weren't expecting that. In fact, what we're going to do is only cover the first nine verses. You see, whenever I come to a passage of Scripture that has a lot of information in it that I want to share, I have to think about how I'm going to divide it up. Because you don't want to stop in the middle of a thought, and the next week we have to pick it up again. Because then I have to do a lot of review to catch up. So what I do when there's a lot of information is I think about how I'm going to split this up. So tonight we're only going to cover the first nine verses, and hopefully next week we'll move a lot faster. We might be able to finish chapter 24, but I really doubt it, and I'm not making any promises. So turn to Genesis chapter uh, 24, verse number 1. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Now, how old was Abraham at this point in his life? Does anyone know? Well, he was about 140 years old. And let me explain how we know that. Genesis chapter 25, verse number 20 tells us that Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. And Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. So that would make Abraham 140 years old when Isaac and Rebekah got married. So Abraham was about 140 at this point in his life. Now, why don't we know that he was exactly 140? Because if you remember, the servant's going to have to travel back to where Abraham came from, which is a distance of 500 miles one way, and then he's going to have to come back. And so there's some months in there. So we, he was either 139 or 140, and it's just better to say he was about 140 years old. So Abraham was old and well stricken in age. Now you need to understand what that phrase means, well stricken in age. It doesn't just say he was old, he was well stricken in age. In other words, age was starting to catch up with him. Now, if you're past 50, you understand what I'm starting or what I'm talking about. Age begins to catch up with you. I started losing my hair in the 
later 20s, by the mid-30s, it was gone. Uh, it seems like I'm putting on more and more weight. I try and lose it, but it's just easier to come back on. Gravity's beginning to work. All of a sudden, you're feeling aches and pains that you've never felt before. In fact, I got tickled. My wife has a bone spur on her heel, and she's not able to jog. And, you know, my wife has never had any health problems. Well, I take that back, you know, pituitary gland tumor, but God miraculously healed her of that. But she's never had any aches and pains. And, you know, from my early 20s, because of knee operations and torn rotator cuffs and broken bones and just uh, torn things taken out of a uh, socket, it's like I have these aches and pains. And so finally it was like, yes, she has an aches and pain. See how it feels. But anyways... Abraham was well stricken in age. And that phrase means that he had aches and pains and he was feeling his age. And now that Sarah was dead, he realized that it was very possible for him to pass away very soon. And he hadn't fulfilled his duty as a father and obtained a bride for Isaac. Now, the reason that he'd waited so long was because he didn't want Isaac marrying a Canaanite woman. But he also felt like he wasn't supposed to leave Canaan. Because every time that he'd stepped out of God's will in the past, he didn't end up in trouble. So up to this point, he hadn't even tried to obtain a wife for Isaac. He was just waiting on God to do something miraculous or for God to lead him. But now that Sarah had died and he was old and well stricken in age, he realized that he needed to do something. So he chose a servant to travel to Mesopotamia to acquire a wife for Isaac. Look at verses 2, 3, and 4. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go into my country, into my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. So the servant that Abraham chose for the special mission was the oldest servant in the house. And it also tells us he was the overseer of Abraham's property. Now, most scholars believe that the the servant that they're talking about was Eliezer. If you remember, before Abraham had any children, he was complaining to God. And what did he tell God? He said, I don't have anyone to be an heir. Eliezer from Damascus, a servant in my house, is my heir. Turn back to Genesis chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. But Abram replied, his name has not been changed at this point. He has no children God has not changed his name and put that spirit from Abram to Abraham, right? So this is Abram. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so, not, so one of my servants will be my heir. Now, Abraham is about 75 years old at this time, and he's 140. You can do the math. 65 years has passed. So when we read in Genesis chapter 24 that as an, the oldest servant in his household, we begin to think, now who would that be? So I want you to think about it. Before Abraham had any children, one of his servants would have been heir to his property had he died. And we're told here in Genesis chapter 15 that that servant was Eliezer. Now, as the heir, he would have been specifically trained to oversee Abraham's property since it would be his one day, or I should say his responsibility. But after Ishmael and Isaac were born, Eliezer was no longer heir, but he was trained to be the overseer of Abraham's property. So most scholars believe, even though it doesn't say that, the servant chosen to, re to acquire a wife for Isaac was Eliezer. So Abraham called Eliezer into his tent. His oldest, most trusted servant, the overseer of his property, and he made him take an oath. Look back at verses 2, 3, and 4 again. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son, the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go into my country, into my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. Okay, 
How many of you want to know why Abraham made his servant put his hand under his thigh when he took the oath? How many of you want to know that? Now, let me ask you this. Are you sure you want to know? Because the explanation of this particular custom might seem a little crass in today's society. So do you want to know or not? You want to know? Let's go for it. Now, I've put out the disclaimer. If you're offended by what I show you and tell you tonight, it's your own fault. All right? So the first thing you have to understand, if you want to understand this custom, is you need to understand what the word thigh actually means. Because he didn't place his hand underneath Abraham's thigh. He placed his hand under another part of Abraham's body. You see, the word thigh is translated from the Hebrew word yarek, and it actually refers to the loins. Yeah. In fact, let me show you how this word is used in other passages of Scripture throughout the Old Testament. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis chapter 46, verse number 26. It says, All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins... Besides Jacob's son's wives, all the souls were three score and six. Now, the word loins is translated from the very same Hebrew word, yarek. Now look at Exodus chapter 1, verse number 5. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. Now, that word loins is translated from the very same Hebrew word, yarek. So, the word thigh is being used figuratively in Genesis chapter 24 to refer to Abraham's loins. In other words, his genitals. So what Abraham was doing was telling his servant to place his hand between his thighs on the outside of his clothes, nothing kinky here, but his hand was to be placed under Abraham's genitals while Abraham was sitting down. Now I told you to be a little crass, but you need to understand what I'm talking about. We'll go a little bit more in depth in this, but how many of you women are married to a man that when he watches football and he's not paying attention, he's sitting on the couch and he does this? Okay, that's what this is talking about. He told his servant to place his hand under his thigh. The word thigh is the Hebrew word yarek. It actually means genitals. He wasn't supposed to put it underneath the clothing. It actually went on the outside of the clothing and you kept your hand straight and you just slide it, you would slide it right underneath. All right, you needed to understand that because we're going to get a little bit deeper in just a second. So what Abraham was telling his servant was to place his hand between his thighs. Now this type of oath was very common in Abraham's day. This wasn't something special. This wasn't something new. No one had ever done this before. Abraham was starting this new custom. Huh. It was very normal in that time period. In fact, in pagan circles, the person who was making someone take an oath would require that they place their hand under his genitals on the outside of his clothes, and this is how they did it. The person requiring the oath would sit down while the one making the oath would kneel down. So the person who was making someone else take the oath would sit down. The one who was actually making the oath would kneel down. They would be face to face. He would take his hand, place it between his thighs, and slide it underneath his genitals being flat. This symbolized that his descendants, his seed, would make sure that the person who was making the oath kept it. And if he didn't keep the oath, the man's descendants would avenge him. They would take the person's life or punish him in some way for failing to perform his duty. So this was a very common custom, especially among the pagans. Now, Abraham and his descendants, and who are his descendants? The Hebrews. The Jews. So Abraham and his descendants adopted this custom, but they twisted it a little bit so it had a slightly different meaning. For the Jews, the thigh, and again, that's being used as a euphemism, we're talking about the genitals, indicated the procreative power and heritage of the patriarch's position as the source of the family. In other words, the genitals symbolized his procreative power, 
In other words, that he had seed and his position as the life giver to his descendants. It was through his, through his seed the family had been created. So this type of oath was kind of like swearing on your mother's grave. Everyone knows what it means to swear on your mother's grave, right? You're swearing on something you hold very dear. Your mother's grave. So as I said, this type of oath was kind of like swearing on your mother's grave, except you're swearing on the heritage of the patriarch's position as the source of the family. And you're doing it in the sight of God who will judge whether you faithfully fulfilled your oath or not. Now look back at verse number three, because when he tells him what to do, he tells his servant to place your hand underneath my thigh, and the word thigh is a euphemism. And then this is what it says in the first part of verse 3. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of the earth. And then he tells him what he's going to make him swear, that thou shalt not take a wife into the son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Now, this is the same type of oath that Joseph made to Jacob when he promised that Jacob's body would not be buried in Egypt. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis, chapter 47, verses 29 through 31. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. Now, who is Israel? Does everyone know? Jacob. God changed Jacob's name just like he turned, uh, changed Abraham's name. Abraham's original name was Abram. He changed it to Abraham. He changed Jacob's name to uh, to, uh, Israel. Now, why didn't he change Isaac's name? Do you remember? Because God named Isaac. God did not name Abram, and he didn't name Jacob. They They were named by their parents. So God changed their name. So when we talk about Israel, we're talking about Jacob. So it says, let's go back and read that. I'm going to start in the beginning. And the time drew near that Jacob must die. And he called his son Joseph. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt, but I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt, and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. And he said, Swear unto me. And he swore unto him. And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. In other words, what he was saying is, wait a minute, my father and my grandfather were promised the land of Canaan. We came down here because of the famine, but I want to be buried in the land that God promised my father and my grandfather and for my children. Swear unto me that you won't allow my body to be buried here, but when I die, you'll take my body to Israel. And it wasn't good enough for him just to swear. He said, place your hand under my thigh. He's going back to this. So Joseph was swearing on the heritage of his father's position as one of the patriarchs of God's chosen people. He was swearing by the person who fathered him and his brothers and sisters. And God was going to be watching to see if he kept his promise. And if not, God would judge him. Now, in Genesis chapter 24, we're going to take a step back. Go back to our original chapter. In Genesis chapter 24, when Abraham made his servant take an oath and he made him place his hand under his thigh, it signified two things. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Because by the time you get to Joseph, they had kind of twisted it and made it their own way. But back in Abraham's time, it signified two things. All right? Number one, it signified that he was swearing on the heritage of Abraham's position as the patriarch of God's chosen people. You're swearing on God's chosen man, the one that God called out of the heathens and said, you are the man that I'm going to raise a nation up from his descendants, and my chosen one will come through him. So it signified that he was swearing on the heritage of Abraham's position as the patriarch of God's chosen people, and he was doing it in the sight of God, who would judge whether he fulfilled this oath or not. And we looked at verse number three, and we saw that. But it also signified, this is the second thing, that Isaac had the right to avenge Abraham if the servant didn't perform his duty that he had solemnly sworn to do. Now, you need to understand something, which I probably should have added back then, but this is the perfect place. 
You did not make someone swear this way unless you thought you were going to die. When you thought you were going to die, you made them swear this way because what you were doing, remember, was you were saying that if you don't fulfill what you've sworn, my descendants will avenge me. My children, my grandchildren, they have the right to avenge me if you don't keep it. So you were actually saying when you had a person do this that I don't think I'm going to live very long. I want you to do this. I'm not going to be around to make sure that you do it. So my children will. Is everyone following me? So basically, the second thing this signified was Abraham was old and he was well stricken in age. He needed to find a, a, a bride for, for Isaac. Sarah was dead. He was starting to feel the aches and pains and he was thinking, you know what? I might not live to see him married. So he brings this servant in and he says, you swear to me that if I'm gone, you're going to fulfill what you promised. And if you don't do it, Isaac will avenge me. My grandchildren will avenge me. So now you understand the custom of taking an oath with your hand under the thigh of another person. So as you're reading through the Old Testament, you come upon this, go back to Genesis chapter 24, and then you understand the purpose of it. Now, what did the servant swear to do? Well, look back at verses 2, 3, and 4, because this is what Abraham wanted him to swear to. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. He's like Jacob. He thinks he's going to die. He doesn't think he's going to see the promise fulfilled. I want you to understand that my seed will avenge me if you don't fulfill this. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth. And why is he doing this? Because if Isaac doesn't do it, God will that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go into my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. So Abraham made his servant swear to do three things. Number one, to never allow Isaac to marry a Canaanite woman. Under any circumstances, I don't care what it is, do not marry a Canaanite woman. Now, if you understand the pagan practices and you understand that they uh, actually participated in what was known as imitation magic. How many of you know what imitation magic is? Anyone? How many of you don't know what imitation magic is? Okay, let me just explain something. The Canaanites did not believe in one God. They believed in, they were, they, they believed in a multitude of gods. There was a God for this and a God for that. But they believed that the way that the earth became fertile, the way that you had great crops, is that the gods had sex. And when the gods had sex, then you would have a bountiful harvest. So the way that you would get the gods to have sex is you would turn them on like pornography. So what they would do is they would actually have sexual orgies. They would have temple prostitutes. You would come in and you would have sexual acts as a form of worship. But the whole purpose of it was to turn the gods on so they would have sex. They would imitate the people, have sex, and you'd have a bountiful crop. And that's one of the reasons that God says, and if you don't understand this, as you're reading through the Old Testament, you think, boy, he just really wanted them to separate and have nothing to do with the Canaanites. Well, the reason he didn't want them to have anything to do with the Canaanites is because of how perverted they were. There was homosexuality. It was not just the, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Bestiality. All types of different sexual sins. And they were corrupted by this. And so, God comes along and he says, I don't ever under any circumstances want you to marry a Canaanite woman. I don't want my son to be anywhere around them. So that was the first thing. Number two, he wanted him to swear to find a wife for Isaac from the land that he came from and also from his relatives if it were possible. Because they had been, even though they were still into idolatry, they still understood what Abraham had been called to. They might not have agreed with him. They might not, not, might not have believed, believed like that. But he had witnessed to them before he left. 
He had to explain why God was calling him out and what God was calling him to do. And just as those caravans came through, and we were seeing this in the book of Genesis chapter 22, the last part, when it was talking about the genealogy of Nahor, and it gets all the way down and talks about Rebekah. He had heard about his family, but just as he'd heard about his family who was in the land that he came from, they had heard about him and how God had blessed him. And in his old age and in Sarah's old age, God did a miracle and they had a child. So, that was the second thing he wanted. And the third thing that he wanted him to swear to was to never take Isaac back to the land Abraham came from. Look at verses 5 and 6. The servant asked, But what if I can't find a young woman who's willing to travel so far from home? Should I then take Isaac there to live among your relatives in the land you came from? No, Abraham responded. Be careful never to take my son there. Now, why do you think that is? I'm going to give you one reason for it. There's many reasons, but I'm going to give you one. Many times we don't understand why God would take the land from the Canaanites and give it to the Jews. Even today we say, well, you know, God promised the land to the Jews, but it's not right to take that land from one and give it to another. You need to understand something. One of the reasons that he sent Joseph down into Egypt, that's part of his plan, and then Jacob's sons went there along with Jacob, and then they grew very powerful there, but then they became servants when a Pharaoh rose who knew not Joseph. And then God had to bring them out. The reason it took so long to be able to do that is because the sin of the Canaanites was not yet full. They had, they had become so sinful that God's judgment was, I'm going, to, I'm going to root them out of the land, the land's going to vomit them out, and I'm going to give this land to them. And he didn't want Isaac to go back because this was the land. He foresaw the future, knew what type of sin they were going to be involved in. He was going to give them chance after chance, but he still knew what was going to take place. And so he was going to give this land to them. So he said, no. Now, the servant didn't see it from Abraham's eyes. He didn't have the relationship. Eliezer did not have the relationship with God that Abraham had. So the servant was going to have to go 500 miles one way to get to where Abraham came from. And the servant wanted to know, well, what do I do if I get there and I find a woman, but the woman is not willing to be this far away from home? Should I take Isaac back to the land that you came from? And Abraham said, never under any circumstances are you to ever take Isaac to the land that I came from. And then Abraham explained why. Look at the first part of verse 7. For the Lord... The God of heaven who took me from my father's house and my native land solemnly promised to give this land to my descendants. Canaan was where Isaac was supposed to be and it was where all of his descendants were supposed to be. So never under any circumstances take Isaac back to where Abraham came from. And that's why Jacob, when he was in the land of Egypt, he said, I'm here, I don't understand why we haven't been brought back. But son, stick your hand underneath my thigh and you promise me that when I die, you don't bury me here. You take me back to the land that, that God promised to give our descendants. Now, Abraham had every confidence in the world that a servant would be able to find a wife for Isaac from his homeland. In fact, he believed that God was going to direct the servant's steps to find the right woman. Look at, if you would, the last part of verse number 7. He will send his angel ahead of you and he will see to it that you find a wife there for my son. I don't know whether Abraham had another vision or if it was just faith that he knew that God had made this promise so this is the way it was going to work out. But we do know one thing. Abraham knew that he knew that an angel from the Lord was going to go before him and it was all going to work out. God was going to see to it that his servant would be able to find a wife for Isaac. Now, as I said... Abraham had every confidence in the world that God would lead his servant to the right woman, but he also knew that his servant didn't have the same faith that he did. And because of that, he knew that Eliezer would probably refuse to swear to do those three things. You see, part of the custom was if someone made you swear and he said, put your hand under my thigh, he's getting ready to die, and he wants you to take an oath, you did not have to take the oath if you thought it was impossible. Why? Why did the law say that? Why did it dictate that part of the custom? Because remember, 
What you were saying when you took that type of oath is that if you don't fulfill your duties, my seed will avenge me. They will punish you in some way, but the majority of the time it meant they will kill you. And so you were not required if you thought the oath was impossible to swear to that. So Abraham understands, even though he has all the confidence in the world, he knows the angel of the Lord's going to go before him. He's going to be able to find the right woman. God wouldn't have brought him this far. God wouldn't have made these promises. God's going to do this supernatural thing if you just go. But he also knew the servant would probably refuse because he didn't have the same faith. And because of that, he gave his servant an escape clause. Look at verse number 8. If she is unwilling to come back with you, then you're free from this oath of mine. But under no circumstances are you to take my son there. Now, why does he say that? Well, he's given this escape clause because he's already said, what if she won't travel that far from home? And he understood something. If I don't make this very clear to him, when he gets to the, where he's going, he might say, well, maybe Isaac will come if you're not willing to go. He wanted his servant to know, don't you even hint to that. So I'm going to give you the escape clause so you'll be willing to make this oath. But then he goes further. He says, but under no circumstances are you to take my son back there. In other words, if you go there and God leads you to the right woman, but she refuses to come back with you, you're free from what you swore to do. But you are not free from what you sworn that you will not take him back under any circumstances to the land where I came from. And the reason he made him promise that was because he was old and he was well stricken in age and he thought that there was a good possibility that he might die before the servant returned or even the servant left. So just in case that happened, he wanted to make sure that his servant knew exactly what to do in his absence. Now, because of the escape clause, Abraham's servant agreed to take the oath. Look at verse number 9. So the servant took an oath by putting his hand into the thigh of his master, Abraham. He swore to follow Abraham's instructions. Now we're through a little bit early, and the reason we're through a little bit early is because I needed to stop here because we start a, a new section next time. And the new section is what the servant was looking for in a mate. What was he looking for? Now we know in the New Testament what we're looking for in a mate. They must be a Christian and they must exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, right? Well, they didn't have the Bible like we had back then. So the servant was going to look for certain things to know who the right woman was. And we're going to look at that next week, but if we started that tonight, we would get to a point where we weren't through. So we need to stop here.